writer's block is a widely embraced ideology, um, not just in writing circles, but it's a time-honored narrative around the writing process, the writing life, and writing craft. And, you know, I find it interesting that we don't find any other profession, even within the realm of creative professions, that attach the word block to what the person is and does. We don't hear painter's block. We don't hear dancer's block. We don't hear musician's block. You know, and this isn't to say that that those people don't get blocks. I believe they do. But as far as I know, there are none that actually attach the word block to what they do and who they are. And I find this very interesting. There's a psychologist named Edmund Bergler, and he did a study on writer's block. He wanted to understand um, kind of what was at the heart of it. And what he came away with was that the thing that stops most people from writing who call it writer's block is that they have emotions within them that are unresolved. And this makes perfect sense to me because when we have stuck emotions, it's like a block, an actual block inside us. And then the flow, the creative flow cannot happen, right? And so I found this fascinating because what I have heard from students and clients over and over is that when they are blocked, what it really gets down to is that the the emotion that they're feeling is fear. And there are plenty of reasons for writers to be fearful, right? To begin with, we are sensitive folks. We just are. We see the world in ways that other people don't. We feel things immensely. And I think if we are compelled to write, that is how we process all the stuff that the world throws on us and that we absorb. And so it's really essential, I think, for our physical, mental, spiritual health that we allow that process to happen. And the fears are very valid because, you know, not only does it mean we are putting our vulnerable, sensitive selves out there for everyone to pick apart, people do pick it apart, our work, and then us, and it can feel like an attack and like we're being stifled. And that's a very hard thing to handle for a lot of people. So I wanted to mention the top three fears that I have heard and seen in students and clients, and then I will move on to a writing exercise that you can do that I found to be really helpful for myself and for other people I've worked with. So the first fear is fear of what they don't know yet. So I think we all know, at least conceptually, that our subconscious is this vast, rich, fertile area that lives within us that is us, that holds so much wisdom, so much knowledge, so many stories that our conscious mind doesn't have access to on a day-to-day -day basis. And so knowing that and the thought of, you know, kind of cracking the surface of that and seeing what's in there is really terrifying to some people. The second one is fear of what they already know. So the reason a lot of people are fearful around this is like, oh, if I think this way, if I believe this thing, or if I have this story to tell, I just don't know if I can do it. And I think the reason for this is that from the time we're very young, we are indoctrinated to kind of fall in line with cultural norms. And writers oftentimes don't do that. That's one of the reasons we write. We want to raise awareness and kind of shine a light on things that I believe can help humanity, right? And so kind of feeling like we're putting ourselves out on a limb, not just for the writing itself or the quality of it, but for the content, the ideas and beliefs that go into it is very fearful thing to some people. And then the third one is fear of what others will think. We all have this inherent human need to be accepted and loved and not abandoned, especially by the people that we care about and who claim to care about us. And so I hear this a lot from people who want to write memoirs and even those who want to write fiction, because as we writers know, if we write fiction, we are not writing about ourselves. We may be drawing from our lives. You know, they say, write what you know. We might be drawing from the places we've lived, from experiences we've had. 
But by the time we create a character and embellish and add things to make the story make sense, it's no longer us. Non-writers don't get that, though. And, you know, people can get pretty upset sometimes. And so it's it's a valid fear to have, you know, it's like we don't want to, I guess, rock the boat or make waves with people. And especially in our families, it's like so many people don't want to make waves because we've been taught that those blood bonds that we have are worth holding on to at all costs. And I strongly disagree with this. And I will tell you why. In a paper called Professions for Women uh, that Virginia Woolf presented, she wrote about the angel in the house. And this was her metaphor for the voices in her head that did not belong to her, that, uh, you know, kind of sat on her shoulder, this pure voice, and told her as a female, as a woman, what she could and could not write about, what words were okay to use and not okay to use. And so she wrote about how she dealt with this angel. And she imagined it in actual form and picked up her inkwell and threw it and hit the angel in the head and killed it. And I think it's a very valuable story to know because we all have these voices. Some belong to people we know, uh, some belong to just our culture, and they've kind of infiltrated us and been in there for such a long time that it can be tricky to get them out, but we can get them out and we have to if we're going to have a productive writing practice. One of the first things I do when I, you know, when I worked with students, when I um, then started working with clients is ask them to write a letter. When people write this letter, many people tend to get really pissed. And this is a good thing, I think. Here's why. When you get pissed, that means you are realizing how much of an effort the culture just by osmosis has had on you and family, friends, whoever else has kind of worked their way into your psyche and planted these seeds of doubt in you, these phrases that you keep telling yourself uh, so that you can't write. I think once we come to face with those and realize they don't belong to us, they belong to others, I think a perfectly natural response is to get really pissed. Right. And so what better way to come out kind of punching and jabbing, and I mean this metaphorically, not literally, than to use your exquisite voice and get your words on the page, your meaningful stories, your brilliant ideas that live inside you that you've yet to tap. What better way to confront that and overcome it than to use your exquisite voice? I want to give you this process now. And I recommend just listening to it. You, you're welcome to write these down. There are several steps. So you can think of each of these as a paragraph that you can write. It could be more than one paragraph, but at least one for each point. And then after I get through these points, I will tell you, you know, some other ways then to deal with this finished letter that you have in your hands. When you write the letter, please do it by hand because something different happens in our brain when we write by hand, as opposed to when we write at the keyboard. We are tapping into our brain in a very different way when we write by hand. And I can't get into all of the details about that right now, but just trust me, something different happens. Write your letter by hand to each voice. So I say each voice because many of us have many voices, many angels, many whatever you want to call them living inside us that strive to keep us from writing. Then I want you to give the voice a name and a shape, maybe a color, make it visual in your mind so that you have something to envision when you're writing. You can put this to a live person that you know, or if after reading the rest of the exercise, you aren't comfortable doing that with a person, then you might, I don't know, give it a shape. So you can maybe say the gray box shames me for writing about this. I had a client once who created a kind of dragon figure that he wrote his letter to. All right, so it's up to you. You can use any kind of shape 
name, whatever you want, but just make sure you can identify it. All right, then describe to the voice what it says uh, that stops you. So get really clear, like think about the exact words that you hear in your head. I'm not a good writer. I don't deserve whatever. My life isn't interesting enough. Any of those things that you hear in your head, get really clear about what they are. Then I want you to tell the voice how it affects you. So again, get really clear about this. So sure, it stops you from writing, but what else? What does it make you feel? What does it make you think and do? Okay. So tell it how it affects you. Next is tell the voice what it takes from you. It takes your writing practice. It takes your creativity. What else does it take from you? And really give this some thought, you know, go beyond just the writing. What does not being able to write take from you? Does it take joy? Does it take perhaps money? If you could be publishing your work, right? So really think about what this thing, this angel, this dragon, whatever it is, what it takes from you. Then tell the voice why you won't allow it to stop you anymore. So this is where you start really thinking about being proactive and getting in front of this thing and just standing up to it and saying it's not going to happen anymore. All right. So tell the voice why you won't allow it to stop you. Then next, tell the voice what you're going to do to stop it. All right. So think about the actions that you want to take. And again, these can be literal. They can be metaphorical. You can fight this dragon. You can slay the dragon. You can throw the inkwell at the angel and knock her in the head and kill her, right? And if, if using words like this make you uncomfortable, please remember it's all metaphor. I'm not encouraging anyone to be violent towards anyone. And there's nothing wrong with having thoughts and writing them down about you doing things that will protect something in your life that is very precious. And that is your ability to use your voice. Okay. So tell the voice what you're going to do to stop it. And then I want you to write in great detail, a description, a passage that's very descriptive of you squelching the voice, killing the angel in the house, slaying the dragon, smashing the gray box, whatever it is for you. Okay. Be as graphic as you like. It won't make you a bad person. You're not going to go out in the world and do it. I'm not suggesting that you do. And no one will ever see this thing that you're writing. This is just for you. Okay. Then I want you to finish with an after you're gone passage where you let this voice, this being, whatever this thing is that has been stopping you, I want you to let them know what your writing life will look like moving forward after they're gone. So those are all the steps. Now, what to do with this letter when you're done? Well, I've known some people to keep it so they can refer back to it. And remember, that helps them. For me, that would not help. It would still feel to me like the thing is still hanging around. If that works for you, then please do it. I'm a big fan of ritual, and I love using fire. And so I tend to burn letters like this. When I've written them, I burn them. And here's why. When I burn a letter like this, I transform it. It's kind of like a form of magic. You transform the story of what this thing, how it was affecting you and how you decided to overcome it. You transform that into something else. It becomes ash, which is frail. And it's easily blown away. It's easily dissolved. It's easily crushed into nothing. And so for me, that's a very powerful image um, is to have these ashes of this thing that I can just do away with, right? And so sometimes I flush them down the toilet. <laughs> sometimes I use them in my plants as compost. Even though I live in a city, I'm fortunate to live just several blocks from this amazing forest. And so sometimes I take ashes over there to the stream and set them free in the stream, 
And so that even furthers the metaphor for me because then it takes this thing, these ashes that I've transformed from this thing that's troubling me, it's ashes, by setting it free in the stream, they're carried away from me. And so they become, once again, something else. They're taken away from me. They dissolve in the water and they become water. And so what is water? Water is about intuition and emotion, two very important things for writers to have and to use, right? So I hope this exercise helps. If you do it and you find it beneficial, I'd love to hear about it. And so below, I am putting links to the article by Edmund Bergler. I am putting a link to Virginia Woolf's paper so that you can read it. And then I'll put a link to a blog post where I talk about this a little more in depth, this idea of writer's fear. And you can let me know in the comments over there if you tried it and how it worked for you. All right. So as always, I'm sending you mad writing mojo. Happy writing.